Thank you for your patience. I'm delighted uh, to be here, honored to be here, really. Um, better. Okay, I'm going to talk um, in the first part of my talk about two traditions in neuroscience and also in artificial intelligence, kind of picking up on some of what Tom said in his introduction yesterday. Um, one tradition that's very popular and one that I think deserves more attention is perhaps overly maligned. And then the last part, I'm going to talk about six-layered cortex and what we might make of that. So the first tradition that I want to talk about, and I want to say from the beginning, I don't think it's wrong, but I think it's incomplete as a theory of um, how the brain works, is the Hubel and Wiesel tradition. I assume everybody here has heard of Hubel and Wiesel and knows the basic tradition of starting with simple cells, moving up to hierarchy to more complex cells and hyper-complex cells and so forth. I found um, one place on the web saying it was the greatest single influence on the ways neuroscientists think about the brain during much of the second half of the 20th century, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, it's consistent with a wide range of empirical data, some of it going back more than 50 years, some of it more recent, like the um, work Christoph Koch, Itzhak Fried, and, and Chen Droga have done, um, where there are neurons that are sensitive to particular people, like Oprah Winfrey, even in a multimodal context. And I think all of this can fit very nicely with the Hubel and Wiesel framework. Um, it's also the impetus behind a wide range of computational models, including some that have gotten really, really popular in the last year. Um, so you go back to the neocognitron model of Fukushima in 1980. It's basically just Hubel and Wiesel. It's a, it's a hierarchy of uh, simple to complex. Jeff Hawkins um, had a popular book and um, founded a company, Numenta, on the idea of hierarchical temporal memory, which is basically another variation on this theme, throwing in Bayes. Um, and deep learning is, is the, um, the theory du jour. It's been on the front page of the New York Times recently. It's, it's um, very trendy, and it's also a variation on the Hubel and Wiesel approach. You start with pixels, you find edges, you find object parts, you find object models. Now, it so happens that in deep learning, some of this finding of the features is actually done automatically instead of handcrafted as in, say, uh, Fukushima's model, but it's still the same basic principle. Um, you also see it in Google's cat detector, which is probably the most impressive implementation of a Hubel and Wiesel style model. So they train uh, a network, I forget how many millions of neurons, on millions of stills extracted from YouTube videos and outspat uh, neurons. You could basically do receptive field analyses of the neurons in this model, and there was one that recognized a cat. Um, and so this was also in the New York Times, I think, the, the front page that Google had built uh, a cat detector. It wasn't told that there was a cat. It simply um, developed its own features that led to it recognizing uh, a cat. There are some limitations. The first is its accuracy is only 15.8%. Um, we don't actually have human numbers there, so that's not um, my critique of it, but it has very sharp limits on scale, rotational, translational, and out-of-plane invariance. So the, I think the most obvious or most important salient fact about human vision is you can recognize objects in different locations if you rotate them and so forth. And this model is still nowhere near human performance on that if you look at the fine print. Uh, so hierarchies of feature detectors excel when there's a small, finite number of categories to learn from. So people are using deep learning, which is a Hubel and Wiesel-esque model, for speech, re speech recognition and optical character recognition. They can recognize license plates better than human beings. Um, so I'm, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't use this stuff. I think we should, but they're only one piece of the puzzle. And they're hardly the solution you would want to use, say, for abstract reasoning, for inference, as Tom was um, talking about yesterday, for comprehending a, a sentence. And it turns out that they play only a tiny role in Watson, in fact. So Watson does use a little bit of technologies like this, but Watson has about 100 different modules. If you um, know Minsky's phrase about a society of minds, Watson is kind of a society of minds, 100 different modules using all kinds of different architectures that integrate a little bit of people and people kind of stuff there. So what I want to say is it's not wrong, but it's not sufficient. I don't think it's sufficient for AI, so it doesn't even actually fully solve the vision problem, and it's not sufficient for neuroscience either. I think there's a lot left to be explained. So now I'm going to talk about a second tradition, and the asterisk here is to remind me to tell you I'm not saying there are only two traditions. I'm, I'm for expository purposes, kind of laying out two extremes, but there are lots of other traditions I'll allude to um, briefly. So the second one I, I um, date to this guy who said, um, this is a picture in 1865, I don't know if anybody recognizes him. Um, he said, thought is a kind of algebra. Um, most people recognize him as an older gentleman, um, William James, uh, and this quote is, is from the Principles of Psychology. He said, the leading characteristic of algebra is that of operations on relations. And what I'm going to try to argue is that the William James tradition deserves a lot of coverage in neuroscience and AI too. Some people might know it as symbol manipulation because um, it's basically consistent with, with people like Alan Newell, um, uh, Herb Simon, and, and John McCarthy called symbol manipulation. Symbol manipulation itself is really a family of hypotheses. Um, I tried to develop a 
kind of um, systematic account of it in my book, The Algebraic Mind. Um, I gave seven different claims. You'll see that I crossed one of them out. Um, the mind can represent arbitrary trees. If we have time in discussion, we can see why I'm retracting that claim. Um, I think it was wrong. Today, I'm going to focus on claim number three, which is that the mind can represent operations over variables. So this is mostly drawn from that uh, book. And what I argued is that what you might informally think of as a rule is an operation over variables, but I'm talking not as a mere description of um, something that's happening, but as something that has psychological content. So we wouldn't want to say um, that there's a psychological rule that a planet follows elliptical trajectories. Of course, you can characterize the motion of the planet, but you don't think that the planet is consulting its core to say, well, I should go 100 kilometers to the left now, or something like that. Um, the interesting claim about rules or symbol manipulation with respect to variables and so forth is that there are things that are actually represented in the brain that, stand, that are variables that allow you to do operations over those variables that are binding. So you can think of a mathematical equation like y equals x plus 2. y and x are the variables. You can instantiate them at a given moment. So you can say x is bound to 2, y is bound to 4, and so forth. And then you can perform operations like addition or multiplication, etc. Or if you want to think about language, which is what a lot of my work is on, then you can take, for example, the classic example of a sentence is composed of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And the point is, you combine those variables, noun phrase and verb phrase, with arbitrary elements, even ones you've never seen before, so you can construct new sentences, what Chomsky calls a discrete infinity. I think, certainly in language, this is absolutely hallmark for how the system works, and I would argue that you can find other cases as well. We can talk about that. There's good reason uh, from experimental psychology, some from my own lab, to believe that humans can represent those operations and that they can freely generalize them even on the basis of just a handful of examples. So if I play this sort of Gertrude Stein game and I say a rose is a rose, a tulip is a tulip, a lilac is a lilac, everybody knows how I'm going to finish the sentence. Um, if I give you the input patterns in the middle, so 0, 1, 1, 0 goes to 0, 1, 1, 0, you can all very quickly discern that I'm probably talking about the identity relationship, even though there are other things that could logically fit there. Um, I gave seven-month-old infant syllables, or strings of syllables like la ta ta, ga na na, and then had the infants try to discriminate between wo fei wo, which followed a different pattern, and wo fei fei that followed the same pattern. The infants were able to make that discrimination. That's a paper in Science in 1999. It's since been replicated. I did it with seven months. Other people have replicated, not quite perfectly, uh, with newborns. So it seems to be an uh, ability that's present very early in life. Now, that doesn't mean that all systems incorporate variables. So I have a, a side that all systems, I think, actually have symbols. We could talk about that. So when we talk about symbol manipulation, I don't think the division is between systems that have symbols and systems that don't. I don't know any systems that don't. But when it comes to variables, not every system actually implements them. A lot of the connectionist work, the neural network in the mid-1980s, was trying to build alternative models that did not have any explicit operations over variables. Um, you could argue about whether they had variable binding. They certainly didn't have the operations over variables, which you could also think of like instructions in a programming language or a microprocessor. So they explicitly got rid of the stuff. And that came with a cost, which is, it turns out they couldn't do any of the problems that I showed you a moment ago. And I went through a series of simulations and through the mathematics and some papers in the late 90s to show what's going on. The basic paradigm is you would feed a set of inputs like the 0, 1, 1, 0 uh, into a system like this. And then when you got to a pattern that had a bit that the model had not seen before, it would give an answer that by human standards is weird. So you'd have the input of four consecutive ones, and its output would be three consecutive ones followed by a zero. Does anybody have an intuition why that's the case? Um, so the network, in fact, is, is picking up on the fact that that zero is um, always present. Um, now, it's not mathematically ill-formed. You all saw the justification for it. But it's very different from what people do in a wide range of circumstances. Um, you can get the same kind of phenomenon in a wide range of functions. I did it with identity because identity is the simplest function that one can think about. But it turns out to be true of, of universally quantified one-to-one -one mappings in general. That these kinds of systems don't do the kinds of things that people do there. Um, it's due partly to what I call output independence. Um, suppose I train one of these models. An auto-associator is like the simplest model you'll find in the neural network. Um, community. Um, so we have binary numbers. We train it up on the binary representation of 12, the binary representation of 6, and so forth. As we go along, the model learns for each output node what are the circumstances in which I should fire. So the 8 node learns to, the 8 output node at top there learns that it should fire in response to the 8 input node and nothing else. The 4 does the same kind of thing. 
Um, in Latin, we might say mutatus mutandus. The two does it mutatus mutandus. But there is no mutatus mutandus in the system. The system doesn't actually know that there is an abstraction that is to be derived. And so the system does not generalize to the one output node. Um, and so uh, hidden units turn out not to help. So these were very popular in the 1980s. People thought that they solved all the problems that Minsky and Papert um, raised. In a technical sense, they did solve some of the problems that Minsky and Papert raised, but they don't actually solve the problem that I'm pointing out. Um, and so they, they're still deeply uh, flawed with respect to capturing human cognition. So uh, another way of conceptualizing this is about extrapolation versus interpolation in what I call a training space. So suppose I give you one zero, uh, 1010 and 0110. Well, it turns out the models can generalize, and this is why people got very confused in the mid 80s and early 90s. The models can generalize, um, but they can only generalize in a limited way. So all the papers said, hey, these models can generalize. We don't need rules. We can get rid of symbol manipulation. But they generalize in a very constrained way, which is within the space of examples that they've seen before. Um, so uh, as the, the green cases are, are ones where you could generalize because they're close to enough to the set of examples that you've seen before. But there's always going to be cases outside the space. I already gave you one, but also suppose that I gave you a bigger binary number. So PDP nets, the parallel distributed processing nets that were popular back in the day, and I think this is going to be true of deep learning, though I haven't tried it yet, but I don't see any reason why it won't be. Um, the PDP nets are good at generalizing within a space of training examples, but they just stop at generalizing outside the space of training examples in the way that the humans might. I think this is an absolutely fundamental limit to the Hubel and Wiesel approach if what you do is you have independent classifiers. This doesn't mean you couldn't build a neural network to operate over variables. And in fact, some people just did it. Um, I'll tell you about it in a second. Um, all it means is that if you want to build a neural network that extrapolates in the right way, you need to implement some of the apparatus of symbol manipulation. And that might be consist of four claims. You need a way of representing variables, x and y, stem and noun phrase, whatever, a way of representing instances, a way of representing the instantiation of a given variable, and a means for performing operations, say add, store, concatenate, and so forth. Uh, there's actually multiple ways to do this. Anybody who's ever built a computer has to do all four. There's no way of building what we would recognize as a digital computer without doing all four. You can do it with pointers. You can do it with registers. Um, there are lots of different ways that people have done it. Um, but it's an absolute necessity. And what I would make as a claim about neuroscience is that we will find some circuitry or system, maybe be a better word, in the brain that maps onto these four things. Not that everything in the brain will map onto these four, but there must be, as far as I can tell, a system to do this. Otherwise, we wouldn't have language. I think we also wouldn't be able to do lots of other forms of reasoning, like transitive reasoning, spatial reasoning, and so forth. Um, and there's an interesting paper that just came out in, in PNAS by Randy O'Reilly and Jonathan Cohen, that you guys, some of you may know, um, and some other folks, where they actually got a model to do the kind of extrapolation that the old networks couldn't do it. But if you look at the fine print of how the model works, it's actually instantiating exactly the claims I'm talking about. It basically uses a pointer system. It's got ways of representing variables of instances, instantiations, and a means for, um, there's actually a node there for which operation you're performing. So it really is a transparent implementation. I don't think it's actually the right one, but we don't need to go into the details. But suffice to say that they actually did experiments that were modeled on the things that I talked about earlier. Um, the important part is the right set of bars under generative. And the standard models, like the simple recurrent network, which was um, Jeff Ellman's model was the most popular model in psycholinguistics in the 1990s, fail completely on the task, as, as I suggested. But this new model that includes the variable binding is actually able to, to generalize on the task. So I don't want to make heavy weather of this particular model, but I think the generalization here is that you need to have something besides pure hierarchies of feature detectors in order to do this. And the something that you need is in machinery for representing variables and doing operations over variables. Um, in AI, the failure of networks that lack the apparatus of symbol manipulation to extrapolate might be thought of as a special case of what I'll call the long tail problem, which is there's always a lot of input of the most common variety, and there's always a lot of cases that you don't have very much input for. So if you're looking at some corpus, and this is, you know, we're in the era of big data, this is what everybody is doing, is they find some big corpus, and there are going to be some things you're going to have a lot of examples are, and the systems are going to be good. So go into Google Translate, and you put in the cat chase the rat, there's enough 
um, databases of, of things in different languages, it has no problem. But if you have a complicated sentence, like most of the ones that I'm saying in this talk, and you feed those into Google Translate, send them off to Russian and get them back, they're not going to come out the way that you came, because there's not enough representation of the corpus of sentences with complex structure. This is true across the, the sort of big data world. I have an example here that's adapted from some stuff that our very own Rob Fergus looked at. There's a database called Label Me. There's actually an app. This is a picture from the app. You can download it. You can help science by taking photos of anything in this room or anything you like, and then you draw little green lines around it, and then you say, this is a book. The problem is, that's what everybody does. They do books, they do cats, uh, maybe they do microphones, but they don't do unusual objects, and so you can plot a distribution of how many um, instances there are of each label, and there'll be you know, 10,000 cats, and there will not be very many aardvarks. And so the systems that are built, at least in a straightforward way from this, have a long tail problem. They do really well with the frequent examples and really poor with the rare examples. This is actually even true for Watson that has actually limited inferential ability. So a lot of how Watson works is actually known. IBM published a special issue of their house journal with about 15 papers, most of which I've read at least a little bit, so I have a sense of how it works. Um, I was amazed when Watson won on Jeopardy. But in hindsight, um, and especially if you read these papers carefully, there is a trick to it. So in all AI, the trick is you want to constrain the problem. They didn't actually deliberately constrain it, but they accidentally constrain it. It turns out that 94% of the Jeopardy questions are titles of Wikipedia pages. So Watson is living on the fat, fat tail, the left side, um, and it's not actually so good at making the inferences that are off the page. Um, the long tail is, is much harder. Um, my collaborator here, um, Ernie Davis and some other people, Ernie Davis in the computer science department, has put together some sentences called Winograd schemas, named for Ten Terry Winograd, the AI pioneer whose students, Larry Page and Sergey uh, Brin, run the universe. Um, and they had sentences like this. Um, uh, Levette Davis and Morganson wrote sentences like this. I wrote about it in New Yorker very recently. Um, the large ball crashed right through the table because it was made of styrofoam. What was made of styrofoam? A human being can resolve these, especially if, if there's not another person talking very quickly. Um, we can solve these anaphoric references in these cases, but you can't do it by Google. These are all designed so that they're out in the long tail, or really they're not even represented at all. People can do these, but machines that are doing these machine learning algorithms that are basically variations on Hubel and Wiesel are stuck. Um, so I have some implications for AI that I think are probably clear enough. The long tail is key. I'll just go to that one. Um, I rewrote a lot of my talk yesterday after having another idea that I want to share for you. So I'm, I'm going to tell you these implications for neuroscience and then I'm going to switch gears a little bit. So the implications for neuroscience are probably also clear by now. The Hubel and Wiesel approach gives us purchase on the, how the brain might do categorization. That's what it's really good for. That's what it was designed for in the first place. And you can extend categorization um, very far, so to the point of rec having the category Oprah Winfrey triggered by a picture of her or by hearing the name or seeing the written speech. So it's a very powerful tool, but it's not the only one. It doesn't tell us much about the neural basis of systems like language, planning complicated activities, abstract reasoning, spatial cognition that appear to depend on extrapolating beyond a training space um, and seem to require the manipulation of variables. We know something about how the brain might encode vectors, but we know almost nothing about how it implements operations over variables. There are a few papers here. There are tens of thousands of papers on Hubel and Wiesel, almost nothing on how the brain might operate over variables. So Hubel and Wiesel offer a great street light, but we need some other searchlights too. Um, if you'll pardon the cartoon, here's feature hierarchies. This is the biggest street light out there. There's some others, population codes. Um, uh, Pat's son has a brilliant paper about state spaces that just came out. So there, there are a lot of other models out there. I'm saying that we need to have operations over variables, that that's going to be really core to understanding the computational properties of the brain. We need to do more work to understand that. Okay, so here's the part that I wrote yesterday. Um, I hope it makes sense. Um, I had one discussion at dinner that made me feel like it probably does. Um, here's the question. What's in it, so maybe you'll tear it apart, but I think it's an important idea. What's in a six-layered cortex? I want to give you a hypothesis about cortical computation. It's more like a schema of a hypothesis than a hypothesis. But here, here's the thing that people keep wrapping their heads around. To the first approximation, the cortex has the same six-layered structure throughout. And so people seem to be looking for the one magic silver bullet of computation that's going to explain the brain. But this is a logical fallacy, and there's a way out. So does it mean that every chunk of cortex computes the same thing? Well, no, not at all. And a good analogy might be to something called a field programmable gate array. I don't know how many people here know what a field programmable gate array is. I see a couple of um, nodding heads, but not many. I'll say as an aside, people have often analogize the human mind to the latest, most popular technology. This is not the latest technology, and it's certainly not the most popular technology, but your cars actually have it. 
have these kinds of things. It, it is a technology that's out there. What it is, is a kind of chip that can be programmed to do all kinds of things, not using the standard von Neumann model of a single program that you go through step by step, but instead by folding things out in parallel using a bunch of smaller items that are sort of little stars here. I don't know if I have a cursor. Um, li the little squares with squiggly asterisks around them there um, uh, are called logic blocks. And the idea is that you can take each logic block and do any logical function. So the philosophers in the room will immediately realize how powerful that is. If you do any logical function, you can, for example, simulate a microprocessor or essentially any function that you want by conjoining those. So there's a set of programmable interconnects that say which of these logic gates I'm going to use. They go out to input-output blocks. Um, and you can essentially build what you would build in a computer program, but you do it in parallel hardware. Superficially, if you looked at two different FPGAs, let's say one that's used in your car and one that's used in your toaster, if you have a very high-tech toaster, um, you, superficially they would look identically, right? If you did sort of low level, you put them under a magnifying glass, even under a microscope, maybe not under EM, they, they would look identical because there are just a few little wires that are different in them that are allowing them to take their programmable state. So you would see the uniformity, and even though you would have two different FPGAs doing very different computations. Um, so you have logic of computer program laid out in parallel. Any cell can be programmed to do whatever you want. Addition, multiplication, anything an instruction or maybe set of instructions in a computer could do. What I want to suggest is this would be a useful way of thinking about six-layer cortex. Um, and here's, here's my argument. Is, I think it could help make sense of two ostensibly contradictory facts that we really need to wrestle with. And maybe these are, core, these are the core facts about cortical computation we need to wrestle with. One is the apparent uniformity of a cortex across the brain. So visual cortex is a little bit different, but not that different from prefrontal cortex. And across species. And we also want to talk about the diversity and power of cortical computation. So the evolutionary psychologists overplay their hand when they say everything is exquisitely adapted and so forth. But there is a lot of really nice adaptation in the brain. The different areas of the brain are clearly solving different problems. How do we, how do we resolve the apparent uniformity with the specialization that we know there? And the answer, you know, how does a single type of cortex handle everything from vision to memory to language and motor control? Well, the answer is you use a single basic motif that has enough logical power to do a number of different things, and you reprogram it either or program it genetically, or you reprogram it um, through plasticity or some combination of both. That's how you do the trick. Um, I think this is a good fit with Evo Devo, with evolution developmental biology, which is all about common motifs that are tweaked in specific ways for particular systems and particular uh, species. So you can think of this in Evo Devo terms. You have this common system, but it does vary from species to species, and in the back varies in ways that are in tune with what those species do. This is from a very nice recent paper by Leah Krubitzer, All Rodents Are Not the Same, A Modern Synthesis of Cortical Organization. I won't read the whole abstract, but um, I'll read the highlighted parts. Studies of cortical organization and species that vary along uh, dimensions such as terrain, diet pattern, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, have differing numbers of cortical fields, different sizes of cortical fields, etc. At a cellular level, skipping down to the bottom, neuronal number and density varies for the same cortical field in different species, and even uh, different for the same species reared in different conditions, laboratory versus wild caught. So you have this common motif that is tweaked. So it is certainly the case. You can look at all the rodents and you can say you've got six layer cortex. Maybe motor cortex is missing one of the layers. But in general, you've got a very strong generalization. But there's clearly some fine tuning that's going on. Some of that fine tuning is genetic. And some of it, laboratory versus wild caught, is presumably um, a function of experience. So if the brain is anything like a field program of gate array, the job of neuroscience ought to, be, ought to begin with an investigation of the range of computations that the individual gates in those logic arrays can perform. So on this view, hierarchical feature detection is presumably one of the kinds of computations that you can do. Normalization would be another, and extrapolations, this is the connection between, with the first half of the talk, extrapolation by operations over variables would be something else you can program those cells to do. Real-world tasks would presumably often depend on complex combinations of the full set of underlying computational tools, just as computer programs often use a wide range of basic instructions. So, I mean, if you go back to the days when I learned to program on a 6502, you couldn't write a program without using all of the instructions that's somewhere in the program, in any program of sufficiently complex uh, nature. Uh, so to say that, two more points, to say that thought is only a form of algebra is too strong. 
Um, William James may have overplayed his cards a little bit, but to try to understand, probably not, I'm probably not being fair to him just because he said that one sentence, uh, but to try to understand the operation of the brain without serious attention to one of its most versatile and fundamental computational capacities would be folly. I think this folly is in fact infesting the field of neuroscience because everybody's building their models without really thinking about the um, operations of variables. So the, the bottom line here is few tasks would be fully understandable without understanding the full array of commonly used computational primitives. So this is where I think we need to go as a field. We need to figure out the computational primitives. When we want to figure out a parser or a social theory of mind or something like that, that's a great goal. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we can do it because we don't know what the computational primitives are. Um, in terms of the brain initiative, which is what we're here to talk about, I think there needs to be a lot of emphasis on figuring out different kinds of computational primitives. It's fine to do a depth search and try to understand everything there is about the Hubel and Wiesel model, but we need a breadth search on computational primitives. I thank you very much.